and welcome to From the EBPL Archives, Encore Presentations from the East Brunswick Public Library. I am your host, Melissa Hozik. This event was presented as part of our Just for the Health of It initiative. Just for the Health of It is a proprietary health literacy program developed by the East Brunswick Public Library to promote health literacy in Middlesex County. To learn more, visit justforthehealthofit.org. Now, enjoy the program. Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kathy Chern and I am a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. This Lunch and Learn series is sponsored by Princeton Radiation Oncology, Regional Cancer Care Associates Central Jersey Division, and the Library's Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Today's speakers are Dr. Todd Flannery, Radiation Oncologist at Princeton Radiation Oncology, and, and Dr. Michael Nissenblatt, Medical Oncologist at Regional Cancer Care Associates Central Jersey. Before I turn things over to today's speakers, I would like to ask you to please mute your microphone and turn off your video. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our presenters will answer questions at the end of the talk. Please note, the doctors presenting will not be able to offer medical advice to attendees during this program. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded and will be posted online at the library's YouTube page at ebpl.org slash YouTube. And without further ado, I will turn things over to the doctors. Thank you, Kathy. So my name is Dr. Todd Flannery, and I am a radiation oncologist with Princeton Radiation Oncology. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today with Dr. Michael Niesenblatt. Um, we appreciate your time, and we look to be a resource at this trying time right now in, in our state and in our country. And that's why we thought it was important to reach out to the community, to be here, to guide you, educate you, and help you or your family or friends during anything medically or more importantly, during your oncology experience. So uh, please use us as a resource if we can help you in any way. And my name's Todd, and um, if you go to Princeton Radiation Oncology, that's our website. So with uh, further ado, I'd like to proceed with my talk. Um, Kathy, can you share the screen or do you yep. want me to? Yeah, just a moment, please. Okay, so I'm a radiation oncologist and Dr. Niesenblatt is a uh, medical oncologist. So uh, he's going to do a nice talk about COVID-19 and, and uh, medical treatments. And I'm going to give a talk about radiation oncology and how that mm. pertains uh, that pertains to um, uh, early stage diagnosis of lung cancer and what are treatment options, especially during this COVID time where uh, surgical procedures and biopsies or bronchoscopies mm -hmm. may not being done may not be uh, being done, and where radiation could be used mm -hmm. not only during COVID nineteen but any time uh, in the treatment of a patient with early stage lung cancer. So our talk is titled "Lung Cancer in the COVID Era." Uh, but we'll be talking about uh, general oncology topics as well. Uh, so my focus is going to be something called stereotactic body radiation therapy or stereotactic ablative body radiation therapy. Uh, in medical field, we always come up with acronyms now, so make things easier to say. Uh, so I'm going to use the phrase, the, the term SBRT, to refer to this type of very specific high-dose pinpoint radiation um, during the talk. We're gonna talk about what is SBRT or SABR, uh, what are the techniques, how do us as radiation oncologists identify patients that are candidates for this type of radiation, what do we treat? We'll go over a couple cases and side effects and the efficacy of this treatment. Uh, our field of radiation oncology has really changed over the last 20, 30 years with the use of more advanced technology and combining radiation and radiology, <clears throat> uh, which I'll show you and then we'll summarize the talk. Uh, our practice is Princeton Radiation Oncology. These are all the physicians in our wonderful practice. Uh, been in the community in New Jersey and Pennsylvania for uh, 50 years, 40 to 50 years. And we serve as radiation oncologists at uh, hospitals. Uh, we have a private center in Monroe and a proton center in Somerset. So we have uh, availability of all forms of radiation, including uh, what's called brachytherapy and all types of radiation therapy. Um, so we are um, happy to answer any questions about anything you may need. 
So lung cancer is an extremely common cancer still in the United States and worldwide. It impacts almost 200,000 people a year in the United States. And we know that the earlier we identify these cancers, the better patients will do. Unfortunately, only 15% of patients are diagnosed as what we consider early stage, which I'll be focusing on. Uh, those numbers hopefully are gonna start coming up as we uh, begin more screening. It is approved now to, in people that are smokers or previous smokers with a certain age to start doing screening CT scans, which is a three-dimensional X-ray of the lung. And with that, we can identify earlier lung cancers, which improves the prognosis significantly. So that's worth uh, communicating to your primary care physician or lung doctor if you are a smoker or previous smoker. Uh, what are the treatments for lung cancer? Uh, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and biological therapies. Dr. Niesenblatt will be discussing the bottom three, and I'll be focusing on radiation. But uh, as we treat lung cancer patients, we want to come up with the best combination or single use of these treatments. And it's important that uh, doctors, medical oncologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists, we communicate. And most of us are attending tumor boards and discussing all our patients with all the specialists before we come up with a final recommendation. Uh, early stage lung cancer, it's still the standard of care. We wanna to try to identify lesions at a small size. Um, and it's still the standard of care to proceed with surgical resection. Surgery is an excellent option for healthy patients. And how do we choose surgery versus radiation? We'll go over more of that, but it's evaluating the patients with what we call staging, which is including imaging, something called CT scan or PET scans, uh, evaluating their overall health, their heart, their lungs, what, are their, what is their lung function? Because we wanna predict how they're gonna do if they undergo surgery, um, not only the anesthesia, but are they going to have enough reserve in their lungs to um, give them a good quality of life or prevent the need for oxygen. And, uh, uh, but surgery is still the standard of care. We'll talk about some studies that are going on that will compare surgery radiation. But at this point, we still, if patients are healthy enough, we are still uh, often advocating surgery up front for early stage lung cancer. Uh, the reason that the, there are different types of surgery, and you might have heard the words lobectomy or pneumonectomy or wedge resection. Um, and so this is the anatomy of the lungs. Uh, it says right lung here. The right lung is divided into three lobes, and the left lung is divided into two lobes. So when we say lobectomy on the next slide, this is removal of an entire lobe of the lung. Even if the cancer is in the middle or just on the outside of it, uh, many times the standard of care is to do a lobectomy. Um, and what we know is that a lobectomy or even pneumonectomy, which we don't do very often anymore, can improve the cure rates uh, compared to a more minimal surgery. And that's where we try to separate when radiation should be utilized. So this is the, uh, these are the lobes of the lungs on the right and left. Uh, the reason that's important to understand that anatomy is when you look at patients that undergo lobectomy, which is removal of one lobe, or sometimes two, or pneumonectomy, uh, the chance of recurrence, you see here five-year LR, that's local recurrence. And this is a very old study, uh, but it showed that there was less chance of local recurrence of the cancer compared to if we just took out a little section of the lung. And that's what's called seg segmentectomy or wedge resection. And the chance is three times higher that the tumor would come back without any further local therapy. So this is important when uh, evaluating our patients and their, and their overall health and their pulmonary reserve to determine can they tolerate uh, an aggressive surgery or not and should radiation be considered. Um, so when we have patients that we identify with an early stage, we call it stage one lung cancer. So that's a single lung uh, lesion with no spread of lymph nodes or no spread outside the, the uh, lung area. We say, what type of surgery can they tolerate? If they're medically operable, can they tolerate a lobectomy or pneumonectomy, uh, depending on where the, the cancer is? Uh, should we do something where the uh, less aggressive surgery, but still surgery as opposed to radiation? And those patients are deemed borderline medically operable, where we're saying there's a little more risk to do a more aggressive surgery, but we want to cure them of their cancer. And these are the patients, this, this uh, criteria of their, of their medical condition, their, their pulmonary reserve, that then comes into play, should we consider radiation? And that's where the SBRT, which is the stereotactic body radiation therapy, 
is considered. Or are there patients that have a very, very small lesion, they're very unhealthy, and we just monitor the, the lung lesion closely and make sure it doesn't grow and their other medical problems uh, warrant no treatment. So there's a, there's a spectrum and a range of how we evaluate patients with early stage lung cancer. So what is SBRT? This is a non-invasive outpatient radiation treatment. The goal of this treatment is to ablate the cancer. So we're not just trying to shrink it or help someone. We're trying to cure them or get rid of this cancer nodule completely. It's delivering very high doses of radiation. So with our advanced technologies, we've been able to uh, deliver radiation in one to five treatments, where many years ago, these patients would be treated for six to seven weeks. And the, there's actually higher success when we can deliver higher dose per day for fewer number of treatments. So they're one to five treatments. Uh, we need to be able to deliver the radiation to parts of the body that can tolerate the high dose radiation. So parts of the uh, body, such as the lung, where you can you know, think about it, we can uh, remove an entire lobe, we can treat a small area of the lung and the patient will have enough reserve to continue to breathe well. So tissues that are forgiving that can tolerate this high dose pinpoint radiation are uh, examples are lung, liver, bone, um, but not necessarily the spinal cord, anything near the esophagus or the intestine. Uh, the, how is radiation delivered? These are multiple x-ray photon, x-ray, we use the word photons, uh, these are x-ray beams, and that's the terminology we often use in radiation, or proton beams, which is just another form of an invisible beam of energy uh, with a charged particle. And these are multiple angles uh, that are delivered, I'll show you the radiation machine, that are converging to the target. It requires very precise immobilization and targeting of the patient and the tumor. So I'll show you how we um, account for patient mobility. We account for the motion. Uh, when, when somebody breathes, the lung, the lung mass, the lung nodule is moving in different directions. It's not just going straight up and down. It can sometimes go front to back or side to side. So we actually will do a, a video, a four dimensional video of how is this nodule moving to guide our radiation planning. And, um, and in order to really qualify for this high dose radiation, we prefer that these tumors be five centimeters or less. So the earlier and the smaller we can identify this lesion, the less long that will receive radiation and our higher chance of success. So this is an example um, of a linear accelerator. And this is a uh, machine that delivers photons and there's a different type of machine that delivers protons, but this is just a visualization of the x-ray or the photon beam and coming out of the machine and being delivered to the patient. And this machine can move 360 degrees. The patients can move on that table that the pa that, that sample patient's lying on. And when we use the word radiation, uh, it's important to understand that these this is a general term. Uh, so we have many different machines that deliver radiation and the different machines are just the company name. So if we use the word linear accelerator, that's the, uh, the most common radiation machine is a Varian. Uh, the company is called Varian. Uh, Cyberknife is once again, just delivering an invisible beam of energy. So it's the same thing. It's just a different machine. Uh, tomotherapy um, and then proton therapy. And these all deliver uh, the form of radiation and can be used for standard radiation as well as SBRT. And this is a, these are different machines. So this is Cyberknife. The middle is a Varian. Uh, down here on the bottom left is Tomotherapy. And on the right is, on the right bottom is the Brain Lab Novalis. But they're all delivering x-ray beams and can be used for SBRT. So how do we define a patient to be a candidate for stereotactic body radiation therapy? We want it to be early stage lung cancer and a patient to either not be healthy enough to tolerate one of those surgeries. Um, sometimes we have a, a discussion if a patient can't tolerate the entire lobectomy and they're being considered for wedge resection where you're removing a sample of the lung, sometimes radiation is actually better at preventing local recurrence without the risk of anesthesia. So we'll, we'll talk to our thoracic surgeons and the patient and the pulmonologist about which treatment may be better. Or if a patient refuses, uh, sometimes patients say, I just don't want to go under surgery. I'm, uh, I have medical problems or I'm older or I had a previous issue with anesthesia. 
and it's just not worth the risk. And uh, those patients are also candidates for radiation. We will have our patients reviewed by a, what we call a thoracic multidisciplinary team. So these consist of a thoracic surgeon, pulmonologist, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, and sometimes cardiology and cardiothoracic surgeons because often these patients, uh, patients are smokers and they have other comorbidities such as cardiac disease. Uh, we prefer to get a biopsy of the lung lesion if it's possible um, up front. Sometimes the location makes it challenging. And the way we do biopsies can either be uh, from the inside or the outside. So there's something called bronchoscopy, where we go through the trachea, the airway, and we try to get to the lung tumor from the inside. And there's very sophisticated ways that they do that now called navigational bronchoscopy or robotic bronchoscopy. Um, there's something called EBUS, which is endobronchial ultrasound guided biopsy. That's used for central lung tumors uh, or sampling lymph nodes. Sometimes patients will undergo a surgical procedure called a mediastinoscopy to make sure the lymph nodes in the middle of the, between the lungs are clear because if they have cancer cells, it's more advanced stage and the patient wouldn't be a, uh, considered an SBRT patient. Uh, CT scan and PET scan are radiological tests that are done and um, they help identify the cancer itself and identify any potential sites of spread. And then sometimes patients, based on the location of the lesion or their underlying health, that a biopsy can't be done. And there are more and more reports, and I've treated many patients where a lung nodule is growing, the PET scan, everyone thinks it's cancer based on its appearance. Uh, they just can't get a biopsy. And we will sometimes do what's called empiric radiation, where everyone agrees on the, you know, multi, on the tumor board or the multidisciplinary lung team that this is a cancer and we consider radiation in that, in that situation sometimes. How do we deal with the tumor motion? So now we're talking about when we actually treat the patient um, and trying to minimize the amount of radiation going to healthy tissue and maximizing the precision and the targeting of the tumor. So we want to minimize tumor motion. We want to track the tumor as the patient breathes. Uh, we want to minimize the respiration rate of the patient. So patients that are taking very deep breaths in and out, there's more movement of the lung, tum of the lung tumor. Um, so we want to try to decrease the amount of the, what we call the respiratory cycle. And then the machine. Some machines uh, will treat very quickly to minimize uh, the patient movement uh, on the table. And also there are machines that are called gating that will actually treat only at certain parts of a patient's breathing cycle. So the machine goes on and off and there's triggered by what we call biofeedback. Uh, so very sophisticated uh, planning of radiation, what we call immobilization of the patient, tracking of the nodule, and then very sophisticated uh, technological advances in radiation when we're actually treating the patient. Uh, years ago, when I first started uh, training 15, 16 years ago, uh, and this was in its infancy, patients would be on the radiation table for 30, 40, 50 minutes. And now we can treat these, the actual delivery can be done, done in a few minutes by the time we set up the patient, uh, make sure they line up. Uh, it can be as fast as 15, you know, 10 to 15, 20 minutes. So it's, we've made great strides over the years. So this is an example of, a, of different, what we call immobilization devices to align the patient. Uh, the patient on the left, this is a plastic uh, mold that will be conformed to their body and attaches to the table. And what we're doing is trying to, to compress the abdomen a little bit to minimize the air, the breathing. And on the, on the right is a different type of immobilization. So there's many different ways to get the patient to set up uh, accurately every day. And then we will actually videotape. So this is the patient during the planning session of radiation. And this black circular thing on the f in, in front of the patient is a video camera that's monitoring the respiratory rate of the patient. And we are acquiring CT images live on this patient through the respiratory cycle to track the nodule uh, as the patient's breathing. So we're doing a, what we call a four-dimensional CT simulation to get all the information of the motion of the tumor. And this is an example of in the, the grayish circular shape is the actual lung nodule. 
And then the pink, magenta, and orange are the nodule through different parts of the breathing cycle of that patient. And what we'll do is we will combine these images and create a target that as the patient's breathing, where is that nodule and be able to cover uh, the respiratory motion of the lung lesion. And you want that to be as small as possible because right around that area is healthy lung. So this is how we will do a, uh, the planning of radiation therapy for stereotactic body radiation therapy. So treatment planning, this is just an example of multiple beam angles converging to one point in the patient's uh, body. This is an outside view, uh, what we call a skin rendering uh, visualization of where the beams are entering and uh, exiting. Um, this is an example of actual radiation plan. So in the red is the target, and you can see that the location of the lesion in a lung lesion um, can really impact the potential risk. So this is a more central lesion, very close to the esophagus, the spinal cord. This is a, there's airways here. And so you really wanna maximize the high dose radiation to the target and minimize the dose as you get further away to protect those healthy tissues. And this is, um, being able to do this has really revolutionized stereotactic body radiation therapy. And this is an example of a, what we call a more peripheral lesion, a lesion further to the side of the can of, in the lung, which is a lot often safer, and we can give higher doses um, to treat that lesion. But now when you're further away from the esophagus, the heart, the airways, there's potentially less side effects long term. And this shows us, this is a graph. So the doses we're giving, when we deliver the, the normal number of treatments is three to five treatments, and we're giving approximately 10 times higher dose per treatment than we would if we were doing a standard breast cancer, lung cancer, head and neck cancer treatment. So the dose for this stereotactic body radiation therapy is 10 times more. And what we've shown in this graph um, is that the higher the dose, the more improvement in local control. So the doses have really escalated over the last 15 years. And the uh, chance of local recurrence of us preventing this cancer from coming back is, is very low with high dose accurate radiation therapy. Uh, this is just a bunch of studies that show um, the local control rate. So usually we quote our patients depending on the size of the lesion, uh, it'll be 80 to 95 percent local control. That means preventing the nodule, that cancer, from growing back in that area at two to you know two to three years. The reason that we often give uh, a, a shorter time period is because many patients that require this type of radiation aren't as healthy, um, so they're not getting lung surgery and they're doing this high dose radiation. And a lot of times, the uh, what we call the follow up is not as long, but. The, uh, the control rate has been shown to be 80 to 95 percent, which is excellent for where we're at. And this is a sample case. Um, this is a 76-year-old patient who underwent uh, removal of the entire right lung for non-small cell lung cancer in the past. The patient's on oxygen, and the patient exceeded expectations and did well for many years. The uh, lung function is very poor. Patients on oxygen 24 hours a day, you know, almost. And so you look on the gray part of the screen is the, the lung, the right lung's missing and the, uh, and then you see a new nodule in the front of the left lung. So this is now six years after the initial lung surgery. So this is a new cancer. This isn't metastasis, this is a new cancer. And what are these patients' treatment options? So this is a patient where the uh, thoracic surgeon has reservations because of the health of the patient and the pulmonary and the lung reserve. So this is a patient who got treated with radiation and what high dose radiation, SBRT. Uh, one year later, you see some inflammatory changes where the lung cancer used to be, but that nodule is gone. And uh, the patient was, uh, this, this last scan is four and a half years after radiation. So this is a patient where this type of radiation was curable and well tolerated compared to any other options. Um, so in conclusion, surgery is still the gold standard, the ideal treatment for patients with operable early stage lung cancer, but this is evolving. There are studies that are going on comparing uh, high dose SBRT radiation to surgery in medically operable patients, but 
there'll be some time. A couple of studies have actually closed due to uh, patients not being part of the trials, either patient not wanting to decide between surgery duration or physicians having a bias over one. Um, but it is, uh, it is evolving. For inoperable uh, or medically unhealthy patients with stage one lung cancer, stereotactic body radiation therapy can be delivered, offers excellent local control. Uh, this is all done, so speaking of COVID-19, this is all done as an outpatient. Um, there's no anesthesia, there's no cutting, there's no bronchoscopy, so except for if the patient needs a biopsy, but this is all done as an outpatient, three to five treatments, so in the setting of uh, the COVID-19, if certain procedures aren't able to be done, radiation could be an option um, for early stage lung cancer. And it, uh, the results are very similar. So across the different types of radiation delivery that we talked about, the different machines, um, the SBRT can be delivered through a varying linear accelerator, proton, cyberknife, uh, the results are equivalent. It's just a matter of delivering high dose precise radiation therapy. Um, we like to always have a multidisciplinary approach to our patients, meaning getting the input from our thoracic surgeons, medical oncologists, pulmonologists to make the best decision on whether a patient should proceed with surgery or radiation. And we discuss both options with our patients and consider many of the factors involved in making this decision. Um, so it's an excellent treatment. Our practice, we've treated hundreds of patients over the years with this and uh, uh, all our sites are, are able to deliver this type of radiation. So I just hope everyone's staying safe and thank you for your time. And, um, and we're happy to answer any questions after Dr. Niesenblatt is done with his presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to address you. Todd, that was a beautiful presentation and it's great working with you today. Thank you too much. This is a picture of our group. One thing that you can notice in comparison to the physicians from Princeton Radiation is that our group is much, much better looking. <laughs> I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure Todd would be the first one to acknowledge this. Of course. I thought a little overview about COVID and cancer might be valuable. Um, COVID, as we all do know now, is a global pandemic with this virus, which um, for which we don't have any therapy right now. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have any specific oral or intravenous therapies that are of proven value. And the initial exposure, therefore, can uh, lead to grave illness and deaths that we have seen mount. It's resulted in an overwhelming impact on our healthcare system. And uh, as you know, as a result of that, we're hearing updates every day. But one of the things about humanity is that we always find ways of being creative, of going beyond our restrictions, our limitations, and finding ways to take this challenge as an inspiration to find new treatments, new discoveries that impact not just the effect of this illness, but, in, but, but impact all of the diseases that we treat. On the other side of this pandemic, there will be new therapies that will impact every disease, every illness, for all of us, we will all benefit from it in the long run. Even this style of communication right now, which Todd and I feel a little bit um, awkward in per performing or presenting, is something that will become more common. It naturally spreads through droplets from infected individuals who cough and sneeze. Combination of social distancing, fast, face mask, ice, utilization, hand washing, hygiene are all important. And as I mentioned, we're still looking for a specific therapy. So right now, prevention is the best treatment. We need robust testing. We are not there yet. We are far behind in that. And when we have adequate testing, we will be able to know who was and who was not infected. We will be able to isolate those who are exposed, isolate those who are infected, and rapidly turn down the impact of this infection on all of us. The risk of COVID-19 is balanced against the risk of lung cancer progressing, however. So for a person with a lung cancer, we can't just stop therapy and expect the disease to remain under control. We have to find a way to treat them, to find a way to control their disease 
even with this oppressive experience that we're finding in our environment. So we need an enormous effect, enormous impact of clinical judgment. There is no standard way right now, no standard therapy on which to treat people with lung cancer when they may also have COVID or when a beloved member who of the family may have COVID or just in the environment. Therefore, recommendations that we may make in the, the under, under the influence of COVID may not be the typical standard, but we try to make them rational and reasonable ways to both treat the disease and protect our patient and families from the effects of the illness. We've all seen this curve in different iterations over the last two months. We need to flatten this curve of coronavirus And if we do, we will flatten those number of deaths from the coronavirus as well, as this beautiful cartoon shows. And we're making a great advance over the last couple of weeks. We've already made that advance in lung cancer. On the top left, we see the flattening of the curve of men with lung cancer in the blue curve on top, and in women on the bottom curve. We flatten the curve for lung cancer mainly because of a decrease in smoking, an improvement in, in the quality of our environmental air. One of the impacts, by the way, of the coronavirus has been the shutting down of all industry throughout the world. The pollution that was in China no longer exists. The pollution in Los Angeles, my sister says, she can see the sky again. Even the glaciers appear to be melting at a slower rate right now as the temperature seems to be improving. And the ozone layer over Australia is beginning to, beginning to close again. Remarkable benefits, perhaps, may be telling us that the climate changes may be reversible after all. Todd went over some of this already, about cancer being a leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. And in New Jersey, 6,100 people have been affected and 3,200 have died just in this in the last year. But the most important thing is to know that there's a dramatic improvement in outlook. More patients are diagnosed with less advanced diseases because of screening. In a beautiful article reported in the last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, low dose CAT scans of the chest in people at risk, meaning those who have been smokers, people who, uh, whose family members have been smokers, People have had radiation therapy for Hodgkin's disease. Low dose, radi low dose CAT scans of the chest have been shown to reduce the death rate from lung cancer by an objective number of five. meaning less than half an inch, the outlook is 85% 10 years. For stage two tumors larger, the hyalur lymph node, that's a lymph node on the side of the chest, the outlook is 35%. The real concern is those with advanced stages of diseases, in which the two-year outlook is only 50%, and the five-year outlook has been much lower. I must tell you that until recent therapies, many of which you will hear about in a few minutes, the five-year outlook for lung cancer was 4%. With the application of modern therapies, including immune therapies, which are inspiring us beyond ever in any expectation, a five-year outlook in a study of over 500 people at Johns Hopkins is now 22% for advanced stage lung cancer, an amazing outcome that we never expected even a couple of years ago. On the left is a CAT scan of a person with lung cancer. Here you can see a little ground glass nodule in what is her right lung, and another little ground glass nodule in the left lung. And a little bit lower down, you can see a larger one over here. It's got a little white spot in the center suggesting it's more dense there, which is of concern because that's really likely to be cancer, which is what it turned out to be. However, over here, you can see here's a person with COVID with little ground glass area 
in the same area as this person, and this is a more classical example of COVID, with a high in, high in light, homogeneous white change in the lung on this person's right side and the lung on this person's left side. But early on, you can see it can look like a person might have had lung cancer. But COVID presents most classically in what we see on the upper right picture. Stage 1A lung cancer is a small spot in the lung. Stage 2A lung cancer is a larger spot in the lung with no lymph nodes. Early stage lung cancer, 1 and 2, is usually very favorable, as I mentioned, anywhere between 75 and 45% long-term outcome. So we have time to address those diseases. A person who looks like they've got stage 1 or 2, we have a little time in this world of COVID in order to address their therapy. Certainly, in persons in whom we might have selected SBRT, like Dr. Flannery discussed, might be preferred for that treatment even now. As you've heard, he might only administer three treatments or five treatments to eradicate their disease. And in a person with other medical problems, we may never operate on them. We may decide to treat them with radiation therapy right off the bat, and surgery may not come into play. So we might refer them either for immediate radiation therapy with any of the modalities that he carefully discussed, or we might decide to delay because we have time. These are the treatments. On the other hand, for locally advanced disease, here on the upper left, stage three, with pleural involvement, that's the surface of the lung, these would be stage 3A disease. Or with lymph nodes in the center of the chest, we call those mediastinal lymph nodes, that would be called stage 3B disease. Stage 3 disease, whether with or without lymph nodes, or stage 4 disease, meaning that it spread somewhere else, well, obviously that's urgent. Those people need immediate therapy. COVID or no COVID, they need to be treated now. Stage 3 disease is a curable disease. We don't want to waste any time. Even a few weeks may be the difference between death and life from their disease. And we need to go in and treat them normally. We are not operating on them anyway. And so a combination of chemotherapy, radiation therapy given together, and then another form of therapy that you'll shortly hear about is what we would do. For stage four lung cancers, they are not operable either. We would use radiation therapy to treat areas that are experiencing symptoms, such as a tumor in the brain or a tumor that might be affecting the bone. But we would otherwise use chemotherapy, immune therapy, in order to address their disease with extraordinary outcomes, as I momentarily mentioned shortly ago. Stage three disease is usually given treatment with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. It is an urgent application of modern therapies. Here's a nice cartoon showing that for stage one and two disease, we would operate or we would give radiation therapy. For stage three disease, which is not operable, we would give concurrent chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Concurrent means together. Here is an example of a person who in August 2019 had a nodule in the left lung near the surface of the lung. And on PET scan, this retired 85-year-old judge had not only this larger mass against the surface of the lung, but a mass in a lymph node in the center of the chest on the left, and a couple of lymph nodes in the middle of the chest and one on the right. This, lymph, this tumor in the left lower lung traveled to the center of the chest on the left and the center of the chest on the right. So we gave a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Now, the radiation modality that we used was delivered at Procure in Somerset using protons. And we selected that because this man was in his late 80s. And we wanted to be very sparing by giving treatment to the lymph nodes and to the, and to the area of the primary site separately, trying to spare as much long as we could. Therefore, three months after the therapy, about five weeks after we completed the treatment, we repeated this CAT scan, and you can see the mass there is about the same. Aha! But now we are going to look at the PET scan. And you can see that the PET scan shows in this arrow that the area that was very bright on the left is now minimized, very, very small on the right. And the lymph nodes don't even exist. 
This tells us two things. Number one, it tells us that the metabolic effect, which we are measuring by the PET scan, shows the tumor already is in remission. Number two, it tells us that what we see on a CAT scan on top, on the right, on the, the yellow arrow showing that little mass, is not alive. That little mass is actually dead. And the PET scan tells us the difference between a tumor that is alive, over here on the left with the red arrow, and a tumor that is dead on the, with the yellow arrow. The PET scan shows us that tumor has been effectively treated. The overall survival of people with stage three lung cancer has generally been reported historically at 40%. What is the effect of long-term survival by giving concurrent chemotherapy and radiation therapy? It's 40% unless we can do something more. Can we do anything more? That's the question. Well, there's immune therapies that are now available, and these immune therapies use as their target proteins or antigens that are released by the tumor and which circulate in the bloodstream and which can activate T cells, which are immune cells that become activated, and they traffic between the bloodstream and the tumor. They infiltrate the tumor, and they can be able to recognize these proteins inside of the cancer, thus killing the cancer cells. Well, in what is called the Pacific trial, chemotherapy with two, overlap, two or more overlapping cycles of chemotherapy, along with radiation therapy, was followed either by no additional treatment or by an immune therapy called dervalimab. And that dervalimab was given every two weeks for 26 doses, one full year. And as reported in this beautiful article in the New England Journal of Medicine, what was the normal standard of outcome here at three years in this slide was this with dervalimab. And there was a 49% reduction in the progression free, meaning the relapse of the disease, a 49% lower rate of recurrence during that period of time. Remember, in this slide, treatment with the chemotherapy, treatment with the radiation therapy had ended a long time ago. The chemotherapy and radiation therapy ended at the third month back here, way back on the left. The immune therapy ended at one year, and this is the three-month year of progression-free with a 49% reduction in relapse. And 57% of people remained alive and free of disease compared to those who didn't get immune therapy, just had a placebo. This tells us that the placebo group was well chosen because without the immune therapy in the previous slide, the standard of care showed a 40% survival at three years. Here with the immune therapy, the survival is almost 60%. This shows a 32% improvement in survival, a dramatic, dramatic improvement for locally advanced lung cancer. And this person that I selected was not a 30-year-old, not a 45-year-old, an 85-year-old. He's beautiful. He's right now back in Florida. He's extremely bright. Interestingly, he has a hobby of reading uh, bloody novels, and I don't really understand why. And I presume that he must have uh, tried a number of cases that were murder trials. It's worthwhile because the, um, the um, death of the um, man who was the first person to fly over the Atlantic in 1927, who died in New Jersey. Uh, his death anniversary was yes, just yesterday. Here is the new standard of care, which is immune therapy using dervalimab. No other drugs at this time are approved for that administration. For advanced lung cancer, stage 4b, there are metastatic disease to the bone or to the liver or to other sites, including the brain. That also represents an urgent form of therapy. They need to be treated either with chemotherapy or with oral agents or immune agents. We're going to speak about, the, about uh, just the first two. As an example, this is a 58-year-old Japanese-Korean woman who lived in New Hampshire. In April 2009, she had a mass in her left neck. A biopsy showed a form of lung cancer called adenocarcinoma. In August, I met her for the first time. I could feel a large mass in her left neck measuring more than two inches. 
there were several smaller lymph nodes in her neck and her brain showed dozens of metastases. She had stage four disease. Now, the normal treatment for that would be radiation therapy and chemotherapy. However, we took the tumor and we analyzed it to see whether or not there was a protein that might have been the driver of the tumor, a driver being something that leads the tumor to, new, uh, to a new career, to a career in which the tumor can invade, spread, and grow rapidly in other organs. You remember driving Miss Daisy. Well, the cartoon in the middle simply shows that there can be different mutations in cancers. Some of them are called driver mutations, which are the lead mutations that cause a tumor to grow. And there can be passenger mutations, which are picked up along the way, which have less influence on the growth and development of cancers. I like this cartoon because it kind of explains the fact that these driver mutations represent targets. Yes, they can make the tumor grow and spread in a different organ, but also represent a weak point. And if we can take a drug that can actually target this mutation, then we can disable that mutation and disable the cancer in its site, whether it's in the brain, whether it's in the bone, whether it's in uh, the liver. Well, what we found was that there was a mutation called EGFR, standing for epidermal growth factor receptor mutation. And she had the most common one, which was something called in a gene called exon 19, which is the most sensitive. We gave her therapy. And what you can see is that uh, before therapy in September 2009, this is what the mass looked like on a regular CAT scan. And after a few months of therapy, it was down to that on the bottom. And the lymph nodes in her chest, which are both in the front of the chest and in the middle of the chest on the top slide in September 2009, were completely gone by February 2010. Along with that, by the way, all of her hundreds of, of brain metastases completely dissolved and disappeared. Well, that is not the only mutation. If we take 100 cancers of the lung and we look for other driver mutations, we can find a driver mutation in a lot of them. In 37%, we do not find it. That leads two thirds in which we do. In another quarter, we can find what's called KRAS. KRAS is important because until just a couple of weeks ago, we had no standard of treatment to target a lung cancer which had this particular gene. There is one now that is not yet approved. It's still in its experimental phase called AG510. And that's being rapidly studied because 25% of lung cancers have this. However, in these remaining 40% of lung cancers, we can find mutations, driving mutations, which we can target. The most common being the one I just showed you, the epidermal growth factor receptor. There's another one called ALK, uh, which is 7%. That frequently is seen in people, by the way, who've been treated with radiation therapy. I've had four people who've had radiation therapy for either Hodgkin's disease or another malignancy who developed a secondary cancer of the lung that were out positive, Hodgkin's being the leader. But most of them have never had radiation therapy. These are novel mutations that occur on their own. Another one called PIC3, another which is kind of like a gambling. BRAF, CMET, HER2, all of these are different names. We have a drug by mouth that targets EGFR. We have a drug by mouth that targets ALK. We have a drug by mouth that targets BRAF, CMET, HER2, RET, and ROS. So six of these eight we can target by mouth. A great advantage in this day, since we do not need to bring them to the office to give intravenous chemotherapy or intravenous immunotherapy. We do not need to give them radiation therapy because the radiation therapy becomes less critical in people who are getting these drugs which treat the brain as well as radiation therapy treats it. So we have a way of treating systemically all parts of the body, because that's where these drugs go, simply with a pill. Now, when COVID is gone, we may very well want to come back and give radiation therapy to a focused area that may not have completely responded to treatment, or that may have developed even the, though we've given these treatments. 
These drugs do not lower the blood count, so it does not weaken immunity. Therefore, they are ideal in the day of COVID. Drivers in lung cancer have another interesting aspect, and that is in order to make a lung cancer, a diagnosis of lung cancer, we normally need a biopsy, which of course we still do, but that is rapidly moving away. We now can make the diagnosis simply on a blood biopsy, which is as simple as taking one tube of blood, soon it will be one drop of blood. We could learn that from, there's a beautiful book by a man by the name of uh, Joe Acorn, which is called We drop blood, and that's where we're going to be able to make the diagnosis of lung cancer. That is not going to pass away from April 14th. Uh, April 15th. Make the diagnosis simply with, and the important thing, make the diagnosis to treat in this slide. So it looks like um, Dr. Nissenblatt had some internet connection issues. Um, we'll try to get him back on. Uh, just one moment, please. Am I back? Yes. Thank you. Here's an example of a 74-year-old police chief with a hoarse voice, shortness of breath, and a 20-pound weight loss. On the upper left, you can see there's a nodule in the lung labeled number one. On the bottom left, there's a larger mass in the lung labeled number two. And on the right, there are two masses in the lung labeled number three and number four. <clears throat> How do we make the diagnosis? Do we do a biopsy? This man was hoarse, short of breath, coughing up blood, unable to walk, and in experiencing chest pain. We could not put a needle through his lung because it would have very much likely collapsed his lung. We could not do a bronchoscopy, meaning to put a tube into his mouth while he was anesthetized because he would have needed to be on a ventilator, which would therefore have potentially committed him to a ventilator after the procedure. So we took his blood, we submitted the blood for analysis, and we found the following test. His blood showed an, a, a mutation in the epidermal growth factor receptor, again in this gene called exon 19, for which we could start a treatment. We did not get a biopsy on this man. We therefore, because he had a presentation characteristic of lung cancer and a gene that we found in his blood, we started him on a pill to target this disease in order to begin treatment to control his cancer. We found the most novel, most effective, and most modern drug, which goes by the name of osimertinib, and started that drug on him just 10 days ago. And we are expecting him to have a great response. Interestingly enough, he started on it, he responded very quickly and was discharged probably prematurely because he was readmitted to the hospital with a pneumonia just a few days afterwards but we are expecting him to have an outstanding response. The standard of chick hair using one of the six oral therapies for this particular gene has a normal standard overall survival of 32 months. The newest drug, which is osimertinib, has an average standard of 39 months, and that is the one that we began on him. The reason it seems to work longer is because some people with this EGFR mutation can later on develop a second mutation, making their disease resist the first drug. This drug, osimertinib, treats the EGFR primary mutation, and it also treats resistance mutations. Therefore, it is likely to work longer, as this slide beautifully demonstrates. So general information on COVID and cancer. Prevention is the best treatment for COVID and also, of course, for cancer. The diagnosis usually requires tissue. However, that's invasive. And now we can do a blood biopsy and obtain DNA, which is non-invasive, and treat people quite effectively with oral agents. 
The strategy in treating lung cancer is determined by the stage of the disease. How much disease is there? Where is the disease? What is the volume of disease? What are the symptoms? And then select safe and novel treatments which are targeted, meaning the oral agents, or immune therapies, sometimes immune therapies with radiation therapy, which we showed. COVID is forcing oncologists to adapt and to become flexible and creative in management, meaning both the diagnosis as well as in therapy. They are expanding our standards. And on the other side of COVID, they will inspire us to new accomplishments. There's a beautiful, a beautiful phrase by Elie Wiesel, which is as follows. We must not treat any individual as an abstraction. Instead, we must treat every individual, every person as a universe, a universe with its own secrets, its own treasures, its own unique anguish, which of course we're all going through, and that it's very special triumphs. And that is what we hope we accomplish in a very small way with our talk, but in a very large way with overcoming cancer and COVID together. Thank you for giving Dr. Flannery and myself the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Michael. Excellent talk. Okay, um, do uh, Dr. Flannery and Nisimba, do you have some time to answer some questions? Um, I know yes. we've hit one o'clock, okay. So, um, so for some of the questions, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and please note that the doctors cannot answer personal medical advice. Um, we have some previously submitted questions. So one of the questions is, has COVID-19 changed the risks for getting biopsy via bronchoscopy versus CT guided core needle? Why are some hospitals not performing biopsy via bronchoscopy for patients with newly suspicious CT slash PET lesions? I think Dr. Flannery answer. Yeah, that's a very good question. and. Uh, you know, it's a tough time right now for us in the medical field because we want to take care of patients and, and the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic has um, affected the uh, access for a lot of patients to medical care, but we still need to take care of the, the vital medical um, problems that patients may face. So, you know, I, you know, I don't, I would recommend everyone out there if you're having symptoms of, of chest pain, shortness of breath, anything that could be concerning. You don't want to avoid the hospital because of COVID at this point, but um, we still have to take care of, of the basic medical needs of, of, of our society and our patients. But the very good question that was answered, uh, one of the reasons why they were limiting bronchoscopies, and hopefully as our numbers come down in the hospitals, which they are, we are starting to ramp up again. But a couple of the reasons why some of the hospitals are, are limiting bronchoscopies are one is because when you do a procedure where you're inserting a tube into the air, 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 uh, airway, uh, the patient could release droplets, a higher risk of releasing respiratory droplets that could be COVID positive. Uh, the other, other thing is, is that we're trying to uh, utilize the equipment and the medical personnel uh, for the most high yield things, where, which are really sick COVID patients or emergency situations. So there are, uh, there are times where we're going to consider CT guided biopsies. Uh, the hospitals I'm working at, we're starting to ramp things back up again. A lot of things have to go through uh, the directors of different centers, uh, whether it's radiology or pulmonology. But um, that's a very good question. But it's to try to minimize the exposure to staff and future patients, the, minimize the exposure of the respiratory droplets, and then also to be able to have adequate uh, equipment and staff to take care of many of the COVID patients that are in the hospital. Thank you. And then there's another question from the person who asked this question. The person's mother had stage 3A lung cancer. The mother had resection surgery, chemo, and radiation and has something called the EFGR mutation. Should this person be concerned about inheriting this defective gene? I'll take that. Um... First, let me just tell you that I won't fly over it like Charlie Lindbergh 
but uh, you can look up that the data on the uh, child. The couple of things here. Number one, lung cancer is not hereditary. There are families that have two, three, or more members who have had lung cancer. They could be women or men, um, but it appears that those are really horizontally transmitted, meaning that they are related to living in the same household, growing up either in a household where they smoked or whether their parents smoked. And so they've been placed at risk because of their exposures. Having said that, however, there is um, an evolving literature in which, although the risk for lung cancer itself is not hereditary, the risk for smoking itself, smoking may be hereditary. In what was called a genome-wide evaluation or genome-wide assay, thousands of smokers were compared to thousands of non-smokers and their genes were carefully looked at, what are called polymorphisms. And an abnormal gene on the long arm of the 15th chromosome was found, which was found to be a susceptibility locus for lung cancer. But when they looked closer, it was really a susceptibility locus for nicotinic acid or nicotinic acetylcholine, which is actually a neurotransmitter. It's actually something that, is, that mediates neural function or brain function and nerve function. Well, we all know what nicotine is. And when this receptor was overexpressed because of this particular gene, these people had a tendency to smoke. And so there's no increased risk to lung cancer itself. There's an increased risk based upon a heightened susceptibility to smoking. And that appears to be the mediator. With regard to the um, person who had the EGFR mutation, however, I would suggest that if this person got chemotherapy and radiation therapy, then we would normally give immune therapy following the chemo and immune therapy, as I showed. In this instance, the person had surgery as their primary therapy, and the standard of care would now be to administer one of the targeted therapies, the one that I showed was osimertinib, and we would do that for two years. There is good data now showing that there is an advantage to survival by giving two years of osimertinib, which has very, very few side effects. There is no nausea, no vomiting, no hair loss. There might be a very light transient skin rash, and perhaps a few people have some loose bowels. It is extraordinarily well tolerated, and we would normally recommend that, but that should not be started without communication with the primary oncologist, understanding that this may have happened a few years ago, in which case none of us would give therapy unless this was, unless this was a recently diagnosed and recently managed instance of the disease. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have a question in the chat. Should all smokers or previous smokers consider doing a lung scan for determination of any possible nodule? The, um, Todd, you might want to take it regarding the uh, screening work, then I would want to say something after that. Yeah, so as, as Dr. Niesenblatt and I both mentioned, there was a randomized study uh, looking at uh, screening CT scans versus x-ray and doing one CT scan uh, annually for three years. And uh, these, I think it was uh, ages 55 to 74 uh, smoker or past smoking history. Um, and it did show that there was decreased lung cancer mortality. So if you are a smoker uh, or previous smoker, there's a certain number of uh, what we call pack years, uh, depending on your health, it is a standard recommendation now for screening CTs like we do screening mammograms or colonoscopies. And it is worth, uh, there are some caveats and part of that has to, uh, the recommendation is to offer smoking sensation guidance and programs. Um, so I would recommend if, uh, to discuss with your primary care doctor or your pulmonologist uh, that question because yes, it is uh, commonly done right now, screening for uh, lung cancers and it's a low dose. So we call it a, a low dose screening CT scan. So a little lower dose radiation compared to your diagnostic CT scan, but definitely 
worth speaking to your primary care physician or your pulmonologist about. And I would follow up by saying, at a recent presentation at the American Association of Clinical Research, it's now been shown that stopping smoking at any time helps reduce the development from, of lung cancer and helps improve survival. Even if you stop smoking within the last two years from a diagnosis, the improvement in survival is 12%. So stopping at any time, not just 20 years before, 15 years before, <clears throat> but today. And one of the advantages of doing the screening studies, as Dr. Flannery mentioned, is that being proactive, looking for disease, is often providing an incentive to stop smoking once you first get the breath of relief knowing that that study is normal. So I strongly encourage people to stop smoking at any time, even if they've just been diagnosed with lung cancer. Okay, and I have another question in the chat. Uh, what about the ATM genetic mutation? And if someone has a mutation and gets lung cancer and needs radiation treatment, if people with ATM genetic mutation uh, get radiation treatment, they may develop other types of cancers. Um, well, I, I see a lot, I'll take that. I see a lot of people with ATM mutations. The person who is requesting, who's asking this question is probably asking about what's called a germline mutation. There are two types of mutations of which we speak. One is a mutation that occurs in the cancer and only in the cancer. Those are called somatic mutations. Another is a mutation that occurs in the egg or in the sperm and which we inherit from mom or dad and which is in every single cell of our body, not just a cancer. Those are called germline mutations. ATM mutations are typically germline mutations. They are known to be to cause a rare disease in children called ataxia telangiectasia mutation in which there can be an abnormality in walking called ataxia or cerebellar ataxia, thymic cancers, lymphomas and leukemia of a type called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. When only one parent has given it to us, that's a single ATM mutation. And we can, people with that, most frequently will develop either prostate cancer, pancreas cancer, or sometimes stomach cancer. I have one family in which there's three members who have also had chronic leukemia. Lung cancer is normally not part of that problem. But the question that's being asked is, are they more or less susceptible to developing cancer after getting radiation therapy? To my knowledge, they, uh, we don't have enough information to say one way or the other, but we do have a lot of information on women who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations who get radiation therapy. And radiation therapy for breast cancer, and Dr. Flannery will follow up, is not known to increase secondary or third breast cancers once they've been given. We do know that lung cancer can occur after radiation therapy to the breast. And so in a person with an ATM mutation, they would represent a prime target for if they had breast, breast cancer and breast radiation therapy, they would represent an ideal candidate to undergo screening CAT scans once a year following their diagnosis and treatment for radiation therapy. Todd, you may have more to add. Yes, and uh, I'm sorry to interrupt Kathy, but I, I have to uh, begin to start seeing patients in a couple of minutes. But in mm -hmm. terms of um, the germline and somatic mutations, uh, as radiation oncologists will analyze that, there are some genetic uh, mutations that come from the parents that do increase the risk of potential toxicity or potential secondary cancers after radiation. Uh, sometimes we uh, send out cancer specimens or biopsies to these other companies and they'll give a panel of almost 50 different genes and ATM may be one of them. And that is in the cancer, but not in the germline, not inherited from the patient. So it's different if uh, you're asking about a you know, pure ATM patient has many medical problems from often from, from birth. So it's important if it's in the cancer itself and not the uh, inherited from the parents, then there's no, um, contraindication to giving radiation, but there are some mutations that you inherit from your parents that 
do increase the risk of radiation side effects or secondary cancers after radiation uh, because of it, a lot, most of them are involved in what's called DNA repair. Um, so it would depend, and that's where you might consider uh, surgery being a better option for a local treatment of a cancer, uh, whether it was breast or lung. And once again, that's where the multidisciplinary approach of uh, oncologists and thoracic surgeons, and um, we, come, we, we review all the patients to come up with the best answer and best treatment. So um, I don't see any more questions. So I want to thank you, Drs. Niesenblad and Dr. Flannery, for taking the time to talk to us and to answer our questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this program, the talk is being recorded, and the link will be uh, the link to the recording will be emailed to the registrants. It will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel at ebpl.org/youtube. The next topic in this lunch and learn series will be colon cancer on May 29th. The presenters will be Drs. Nell Maloney Patel, Ira Merkel, James Salwitz, and Joseph Pepe. So I want to thank you all for joining us today and have a great day and stay safe. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Niesenblatt. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Hope everybody learned a good deal. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us for this week's Encore presentation. To join us for live programs or to learn more about the East Brunswick Public Library, visit our website at ebpl.org.